Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. I'll hold this close. Um, welcome. My name is Kurt Langlotz. Uh, welcome to our Grand Rounds uh, at a newer time. I know there's a line of folks in the back getting food who can do so quietly and, and take seats. Um, for today's speaker, uh, uh, there were a number of us who were vying for the uh, pleasure of introducing Dr. Sodickson, who's our Grand Round speaker today. Uh, I'm so pleased that I have the honor of doing so. Um, he was nominated by a, a large number of faculty, and uh, I know I got to know his work best fairly recently when I saw him give a New Horizons lecture at the RSNA. Um, but I know I was talking to a number of others here who have known his work since one of his first presentations ever at a meeting and had the experience of being at a meeting and saying, is there, someone asks you, is there anything at this meeting that you should see? And say, go see his poster, go see his poster. Uh, so that was one of the, I guess that was one of the first presentations ever at a meeting. This is, Kim was just telling me this story. Um, so delighted to, to be here and introduce him. Um, I don't normally dwell on someone's undergraduate uh, degree in a grand rounds introduction, but uh, <laughs> smart. But, uh, but um, Dan Sodickson has a BS in physics and a BA in humanities from Yale and won the award for the top honors in each of those two disciplines. So since we're here in Silicon Valley, it kind of reminded me of Steve Jobs who talked about, you know, bringing together the arts and the sciences. <clears throat> and I thought maybe if Steve stayed in school, he might have accomplished what you've accomplished over your career. Uh, so uh, Dan went on to be uh, to uh, the Harvard MIT HST program, got an MD, PhD in medical physics, uh, joined the Harvard faculty uh, and became a, a tenured associate professor at NYU. His pioneering work that we were just talking about is in parallel imaging, which is now a routine part of uh, scanners everywhere. Um, his research interests relate to image acquisition and reconstruction, including parallel imaging, compressed sensing, and artificial intelligence. Uh, he has been a distinguished investigator at the Academy of Radiology, by the Academy of Radiology Research, which just acknowledges his very long uh, history of NIH grant funding and uh, preeminent science. He has mentored a very, very large group of uh, graduate students, postdocs, and other trainees uh, throughout his career. Uh, he last year just completed a term as uh, president of ISMRM. Uh, he is uh, a fellow of the ISMRM and in fact received the ISMRM gold medal. I thought this was a misprint in 2006 as an assistant professor. So uh, incredibly impressive. Uh, so uh, we're really pleased to have him here today to talk about uh, some of the work ongoing in how we can uh, better produce imaging, uh, images, see things that can't be seen. Um, he uh, leads the Center for Advanced Imaging Innovation and Research uh, at NYU, which is an NIH-funded National Biomedical Technology Resource Center. Uh, earlier this year was named director of the Institute for Engineering and Biomedicine at NYU, uh, otherwise called Tech for Health. Uh, so he's leading a large team to develop uh, rapid, continuous, comprehensive imaging techniques, uh, many of the same kinds of things that uh, are happening here in RSL. Uh, and he was acknowledging from the podium here all of the, the luminaries that he knows here. So uh, we're especially pleased that he can be here today uh, to talk to us about uh, imaging in a changing world, the scanners of the future and the future of scanning. So please welcome Daniel Sodickson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kurt. Uh, you can all hear me? I'm calibrated, good. Uh, so it's really a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here today to consider with you some of the current and future luminaries in the field, uh, what I think is the surprising future of imaging in our changing world. In order to do this right, I'd like to start at the beginning. Whoops, how do we get this off? There we go. In the beginning, there was darkness, and then there was light. From the earliest dawn of human history, people have sought to extend their vision. They looked up to the sky, 
They built tools to help them see further and see clearer. And if you think about it, that's what we medical imagers do. We are the explorers of inner space, even though we may not feel this as we go about our daily work. And this is why I, I feel it's important to begin this way. Just as with any outwardly focused exploration, um, whenever we engage in an endeavor like this, whenever we extend our vision, we invariably expand our minds. So here are my disclosures for your consideration before we get started. And here's the path I'd like to take through the topic today, breaking up my title into three pieces. First, a little bit about a changing world, next, the future of scanning, and finally, the scanners of the future. So I think you might all agree that we live in a somewhat tumultuous time, both in general and in particular for imaging. I would argue that at the same time, it's a time of remarkable creative inspiration and innovation at one and the same time. And these are uh, slides actually taken from the Course of Empire series by Thomas Cole. It's the same setting um, depicted at different parts of, of human history. We seem to be occupying different parts at one and the same time. So let's talk a little bit about the yin-yang of disruption here. Disruptive forces abound nowadays, and so does disruptive innovation. On the disruptive forces side, I think radiology has been experiencing some profound challenges to our value proposition. And it seems, and I, I trust some of you would agree, that the bigger our data sets get, almost in direct proportion, the smaller the reimbursements grow. Um, and this presents a real challenge for value and imaging. So this has a, a number of consequences for our enterprises and our, our individual practitioners. In terms of enterprise effects, obviously there is a premium on efficiency. I'm sure your chair knows a thing or two about this. I'm sure all of you uh, who are in the day-to-day -day grind of, of radiology experience this. For us in New York, and I expect in many other places as well from what I've heard, this has led to a remarkable consolidation of imaging enterprises. So lots of smaller enterprises that used to populate the landscape have gone under and have been absorbed by enterprises like ours. So just to tell that story in numbers, this number here, 345,000, that's the number of imaging exams performed in our department, all modalities, back in 2009 when our current chair, Michael Recht, uh, took office. This is our number today. So obviously a pretty remarkable growth. I'd love to attribute all of that to increased efficiency. There's also, however, a substantial component that has to do with all of these other enterprises, these outpatient centers that we've been absorbing. And just a few other numbers for you, just to introduce you to our department, but also to this trend. So we grew from you know, a little over 100 radiologists back then to 220 or so, probably more radiologists, uh, 130 research staff, 50 scanners in the enterprise at about 30 outpatient centers. Um, and we've also been really focusing on workflow. So uh, recently we reported a reduction in turnaround time between patients at one of our newer outpatient sites from about seven minutes to about two minutes. Um, which makes a remarkable amount of money, which can then be turned back into research and so on. So these are all pressures that I think we're all feeling. Let's talk about individual radiologists, though. That premium on efficiency, of course, is passed down to all of them as well. And I'm sure you're all of you familiar with the phenomenon of image overload. Just to give you another numerical story, I love this number. This was, was generated by Yvonne Louis our uh, director of AI in uh, radiology at NYU. This is approximately the number of voxels that an average radiologist in our department is called upon to inspect closely in the course of a day. So 2.5 billion. <laughs> um, this is a significant load. So what can we do about all of this? At the same time, I don't think any of you would disagree that this is a time of remarkable disruptive innovation in the world, but particularly in the field of imaging. And we have new entrants like big tech. I realize I'm sitting in the center of big tech here in many ways uh, um, in Palo Alto, but also an increasing profusion of small startups, which I personally haven't seen in the field of MR, for example, in a long time. It was dominated by a few small players. 
modular electronics, and of course, the advent of AI. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk at least a little bit about AI uh, in this talk about the future. So here, of course, is one of the prevailing views of artificial intelligence from the vantage point of radiology. Um, got going in, in, in earnest when um, uh, Jeff Hinton announced publicly that we should stop training radiologists because computers were going to do their job better than they in a few years. Turns out that prediction didn't come true, and so there's a, a slightly more um, you know, reasonable picture and, and more collaborative picture of AI that's been emerging in radiology nowadays, the, the, the collaborative picture here. Um, and I like very much to refer to a very succinct quote by uh, my introducer, uh, Dr. Langwaltz. Um, AI won't replace radiologists, but radiologists who use AI will replace those who don't. I think that, that puts a very nice point on it. A number of you who are in the radiology circles might be more familiar with the trends at RSNA where you see AI you know, growing up everywhere. For those of you who aren't intimately familiar with ISMRM, let me tell you a little bit about what's been happening there. So I did this search uh, back uh, a year ago, uh, just comparing the growth in number of abstracts in deep learning, artificial intelligence, neural net, many things associated with AI. And between 2016 and 2017, on average, about an order of magnitude growth in abstracts. One year. I've seen trends before. I've never seen anything like that at the ISMRM or elsewhere. And I just updated it recently um, for this year. And you can see we're not maintaining the same tenfold necessarily, but it is still growing dramatically. There are even some who have suggested we should change the name uh, of the society to the International Society for Magnetic Resonance in uh, artificial intelligence or something like that. Um, anyway, um, the, the ISMRM also in recognition of these trends put on not just one but two workshops on machine learning in MR this year. That, that's something that's also pretty unprecedented and of course uh, Greg Zaharchuk uh, there led the first one and co-led the second one with uh, our Florian Knoll from NYU. So this is clearly on everybody's mind. Change is everywhere and change is fast. So now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the future of scanning and highlight what I see anyway as two very interesting provocative trends in the field. We'll see if you agree. One, a move from snapshots to streaming and another, a move from imitating the eye to emulating the brain. So let's talk about snapshots to streaming. And I'm going to now fr from here on really focus on MRI since it's my professional home for a couple of decades. Um, and for those of you who work every day with MRI, um, you may you know, not, not, not recall immediately what all of that Sturm and Drang is that converts all of these you know, banging noises into a, a picture of, of what ails you for the patient. Um, just to review quickly, you have a series of pulse sequences which are essentially carefully choreographed dances of magnetic fields that are designed to produce different contrasts, different views of pathology, which taken together give you a, a, a nice uh, sort of diagnostic capability. The problem is there's time in between each one of these and they each are carefully tuned and there's a lot of training required to, to get this going. By the way, all of that choreography comes from a really remarkable history of innovation in MR. A number of people in this room having been key parts of that. But starting back in 1973 and moving on to today, a remarkable series of developments in fundamental units, in bringing biophysics into the imaging, in hardware, in acceleration. What did we do with all of that remarkable innovation? We just packed more stuff in, right? So the faster we got, the more we realized we could fit in the same amount of time. So this is one of the key offenders when it comes to imaging speed. This is a cardiac imaging exam coming in at around 60 minutes, say. And you have all of these complex planning stages and the different angles that you have to plan in the heart and so on. And each one of these Ds is dead time where the patient's doing nothing, just sort of sitting there in the scanner, but the operator is furiously trying to get things going. And then we have you know, some remarkable number of breath holds. And of course, you know, whoever came up with the bright idea that we, could take, we should take somebody with cardiovascular disease and tell them to hold their breath 15 times, uh, I wonder what they were thinking, right? So if you think about it, the modern paradigm of MRI and of imaging generally is a little bit like art photography. We, we, we tell our poor beleaguered patients, okay, so now freeze for the camera, work it, work it, work it, <laughs> hold your breath. <laughs> and then we go on to the next one, right? It's crazy, it's not a modern paradigm. 
So let me show you one attempt at a new paradigm that we've been developing at NYU that's gotten some traction around the world too and variants of which are throughout the field and, and, and a number of them represented here. So here, rather than taking a snapshot at a time, patient goes into the scanner, you press a big green go button, doesn't have to be green, and you start gathering data. And in this case, this is a golden angle radial trajectory. It's something we're very fond of at NYU. Basically, the, the key thing about it is that each new radial spoke fills in the biggest gap that's available on the unit circle, and it continues in a non-repeating way. So you're never getting the same information twice. Well, let's say 10 minutes later, you're done with the scanning, patient comes out of the scanner, you set the computer to work. And in this case, these are some examples of what comes out of that long data set. It's actually a five-dimensional data set. I'll tell you why it's five dimensions in a second. So you can get images of the dynamics of the heart in any plane you want. You can slice through this five-dimensional data set any way you like. You can freeze at particular points in cardiac contraction and look at the morphology. You can do curved planes through the coronaries and get these coronary images at end diastole and systole, all from the same continuously acquired data set. No planning, no different angles, nothing like that, no dead time. And this is work, by the way, done in collaboration with Matthias Stuber's group at uh, Lausanne, uh, and is the brainchild of some of these brilliant people here uh, at NYU, Li Feng, Ricardo Tazo, Tobias Bloch, Hirsch Chandarana, Leon Axel. And this is the GRASP technique, and just to show you a little bit more about how this works, the idea is you gather these radial spokes continuously, you just move along in time. Let me ask you, where's the temporal frame here? Where does the image start and end? You can choose to group a large number of spokes together and get a relatively high resolution image with relatively coarse temporal resolution, or you can group a smaller number and have to lean a little harder on parallel imaging, compressed sensing, other acceleration techniques. You can start anytime you want because each one of these spokes, there's no preferential angle. Each one of the spokes can just as well start an image. So you can follow a temporal bolus of contrast to agent or something like that. You can do it after the fact. You don't have to worry about missing it. And you also have a certain degree of motion robustness because you're always passing through the center of case space. So you, you get a kind of motion blurring. Well, you can do more than just um, being motion robust, you can add dimensions. And I was getting at this before. So you have this single continuous acquisition. This is a slide from Ricardo Otazo, where the heart is beating during this and it's riding up and down on top of the diaphragm. But if you can get enough information from each of those spokes to tell you what motion state that spoke belongs to, and there's you know, a whole art to doing that I'm happy to discuss later, basically you can sort those spokes into a cardiac motion dimension and a respiratory motion dimension. Each one of them is going to be much more highly undersampled than it otherwise would, but that's okay because now the beauty of something like compressed sensing is once you have a nice coherent motion direction, it works better and you can get more acceleration. So the bottom line is you now have this sorting and you can take this data set and you can sit at one phase of respiratory motion and just look at the cardiac motion with no diaphragmatic motion at all. Or if you want, you can sit at one phase of cardiac contraction and just look at what happens to the heart during respiration. And one of the interesting things you might note is that you have this septal motion here. That's actually due to changes in pressure state. That's not due to contraction. That's something that was very hard to see before without being able to freeze it like this. So it's actually new information that's coming out of tracking the motion. And speaking of new information, you can do more than that. So this is an approach, once again, from Ricardo Otazo uh, using a so-called L plus S decomposition for those in the know. Um, but basically, you can take this same kind of continuously acquired data set and not just segment it into different motion periods, you can actually derive quantitative motion fields. So you can get vectors at each voxel saying where that voxel is moving and how much at any given time. It's nice. What would you do with it? <laughs> Well, here's one idea. One thing we're doing is trying to apply it now to lung imaging. And if you get motion fields like this in the lung, you could imagine now doing pulmonary function tests, but localized pulmonary function tests. If any of you have asthma, you know, what they ask you to do in the pulmonologist's office is you come in and you have to breathe against resistance onto this tube and you get results for the whole lung. Here we could say, no, this little piece of the lung is having trouble expanding or contracting. So there are things like this you, you can imagine doing. You can also do more than that. Rather than just getting one contrast, your nice sort of T1-weighted gradient echo stuff, you can now look at 
a continuous comprehensive exam for liver MRI, for example, where you get in phase, opposed phase, fat sad, pre and post contrast, all just once again with a continuous acquisition. This is work by Thomas Benkert, who uh, is now working with Siemens, but was working with us before and, and got the Robbie Young Investigator Award for this a couple years back. And then here's an example from colleagues at Cedar sinai uh, Anthony Christodoulou and uh, um, Debbie Ali. This is, was recently published in Nature Biomedical Engineering, uh, this fascinating MR multitasking approach. What they do is they now have, I could finally use the pointer, um, two spatial dimensions, a cardiac motion dimension, a respiratory dimension, but also a T1 recovery dimension and a T2 preparation dimension. So what this means is from that same continuously acquired data set, they pull out not only the anatomy and the dynamics, but also quantitative T1 and T2 maps, which move along with the heart, all from one continuous acquisition. And then, of course, I have to show some examples from here, right? Um, so uh, this is from Joseph Chang and Shreyas Pasanawala, also Mickey Lustig, formerly of, of Stanford, now of Berkeley. And this is, is it seven-dimensional MRI? In any case, um, it's now quantitative flow encoded in a continuous acquisition approach where you're getting now not only the anatomy and function, but you're getting the blood flow quantitatively as well, being used to identify pediatric congenital anomalies and such. So bottom line of all of this is that 4D is the new 3D, right? 5D is the new 4D and so on, <laughs> right? There's a, an explosion of dimensions in the field. Paradoxically, rather than increasing the complexity of the exam, this added complexity and dimensionality is dramatically simplifying workflow. You press a button, you wait, and then you put all of the weight on the computer thereafter. So in some ways, we're talking about replacing this paradigm of art photography with a much more modern paradigm, a streaming paradigm, right? Capture everything all the time, work it out afterwards. So I said work it out afterwards. Um, what do you do with all of this information, right? It's hard enough to reconstruct a single stream of data. Now you've got all of this dynamic information flowing in in multiple dimensions. Well, this actually reminds me of another phenomenon. Let's say you're sitting at a concert, and this is an image from an Ed Sheeran concert I attended with my family a couple years ago, one of the areas of music that we can all agree on, um, so it works very well. But when you're at a concert like this, you're constantly assailed by sensory stimuli, right? You've got auditory stimuli coming at you. You've got visual stimuli, tactile stimuli. If you're unlucky, maybe a little olfactory stimulus uh, working in as well. And all of this is being processed in a streaming way by the brain and turned into actionable information. Why can't we do that with our images as well? And that now what I'm going to tell you about is ways that we can, in fact, do precisely that. And this leads to the next trend, moving from sort of blind imitation of the eye. I didn't, I didn't mean that uh, uh, paradox there, sorry. But anyway, imitation of the eye to emulating the brain. And this, of course, is where AI comes in, but not AI in the sense of image interpretation, which is, of course, red hot nowadays. This is more in the sense of data stream interpretation. So just to review for you what happens in the normal case, well, we have our input information in case space, and we have some reconstruction process that turns it into the output image. In the simple case, a Fourier transform, and we're done. But of course, if we want to start imaging faster, well, we kind of have a problem. You know, if acquiring data takes time, then the natural thing is to just take less data if you want to go faster. But if you just blindly take less data and do a Fourier transform, you get an image that doesn't look so, so happy, right? So there's a long history, and I won't belabor it, um, of doing more with less. This is the evolution of rapid imaging in MRI. And I'll just show you a few examples leading up to how AI can really make a difference in this arena. One approach to doing more with less was parallel imaging. And the idea here was, you know, even though you can't undersample one data set with impunity, if you're lucky enough to have an array of coils that cover different parts of the body, well, actually, you have multiple different copies of that data set, each of which is modulated differently by the coil sensitivity of that coil. And so with the right algorithms, you can just stitch them back together and generate a full data set. And just for those of you who are curious about that uh, 1997 conference that I think uh, Kurt and Kim were referencing, this is what I looked like back then. <laughs> um, 
boy, did I know nothing. Um, anyway. <laughs> So that's parallel imaging. Now, the discerning among you might say, well, wait a second. You're not really doing more with less. You're actually adding data, right? You're undersampling each data set, but you're adding multiple coils, so the total amount of data still satisfies the Nyquist criterion. We're fine. All right, let me try a little harder then. Here's something that was invented at Stanford. You take your data, you undersample in a random pattern, and you get a crappy looking image. Then you apply a magic nonlinear reconstruction and you get the image back. Hmm. So Professor Nyquist, not so happy <laughs> with that. It's, it's a whole different ballpark. How does it work? Apologies to those of you who invented compressed sensing, but for those of you who didn't, um, this is my quick take on how compressed sensing works. We all know images are compressible, right? Whenever you take a picture on your phone and you want to send it to somebody, you get the option small, medium, or large, care of JPEG algorithms, right? So if we can compress images by so much, why in the world do we spend all that time sampling? We do because we don't know a priori which data we're allowed to throw away, right? The compression algorithms figure out which data is important and which isn't, and they throw away the unimportant stuff. But what if we could pre-compress? And this is, in fact, what compressed sensing does. Random undersampling, as I showed you, preserves the basic structure of the images, but buries it under noise, right? So this up here, you can still tell it's a brain. It's just buried under all this junk that we've introduced by undersampling. So you can remove the junk by searching directly for the most compressed or sparsest image that fits the data and go directly to that. And this, of course, is work um, you know, uh, by Mickey Lustig, uh, working with, with John Polly and others. Um, starting in 2007, this sort of took the world of imaging by storm. So to go back to our musculoskeletal image um, kind of idiom here, what you're doing is you're going from the raw data, you're, try, you're searching to find the best compressed image, and then you're simply uncompressing it to get your final result. The challenge with that is that traditional compression algorithms have a nasty tendency to oversimplify images. So for those of you who have looked at compressed sensing images, sometimes if they're not done right, they tend to look a little blocky. The reason is that we're trying to force this relatively complex image into a relatively simple representation for a good cause, but so be it. So we have all this bestiary now of ways of going from the raw data to the image, parallel imaging, compressed sensing, combinations of the above, various algorithms, and of course with every algorithm you know, comes two acronyms. Um, can't we just learn that transform? Yes, we can. So this is early work from Florian Knoll uh, at NYU and Kirsten Hammernick representing a collaboration with Graz. Basically, it's a variational network for reconstruction of accelerated MRI data. Basically, what they did is they took a whole bunch of raw data sets that were undersampled and a whole bunch of fully sampled images and learned the transform, trained a neural net, a particular type of neural net I'll mention in a second, in order to get this. And here's the net result. So on your left, you see a fourfold accelerated parallel imaging study of a knee. And parallel imaging blows up noise when you go too high in acceleration, so not too nice an image. This is the result when we do a deep learning trained reconstruction. And you can see the features better. You have faster imaging, you can get to higher accelerations. The other thing that's noteworthy is once you've trained your neural net, which takes forever, it's blindingly fast to reconstruct. It's just like the sensory information flowing through the layers in the brain. So you get fast processing, and the other thing that was a nice surprise for us, our radiologists much preferred these images to traditional compressed sensing and parallel imaging images because they had more natural image appearance or somehow capturing the texture they're used to seeing as well. Okay, so this is the point of the story when Facebook enters the picture. Facebook, you're saying? <laughs> That's the usual response I get. Um, so we decided that in order to cover more ground with this area, and by the way, one thing I should say, you know, that, that work was, that I just showed was some of the first work on deep learning for image reconstruction, but there's a, been a remarkable profusion since, and there have been some really wonderful uh, you know, contributions to that field coming right from here. So this is an area um, that's very hot right now. In order to explore more areas of this search space, we decided it would be beneficial to collaborate. And what happened was a colleague who was working with Facebook and with us 
said, hey, listen, Facebook AI research, sort of their Bell Labs, their research division on AI, is looking for problems of positive impact on humanity, problems of import that also advance the state of the art in, in imaging. I think you should talk to them. And so we set up a phone call and we tried to convince them that the imagery construction was a really good AI for good type of project. And they bit, and I'll tell you in a second more uh, some of why they bit. They thought it was a very interesting problem. And we also discovered we kind of had a common interest in open sourcing and sort of shared data and algorithms. So we announced the, uh, uh, the collaboration in August. And of course, because the Facebook name was attached, all of a sudden it got all, the, all this press coverage. I've never had so much coverage of image reconstruction in my life. <laughs> the goals of the project are to accelerate MR exams by a factor of 10, to improve the accessibility of MRI in cases where you're limited in your, in your resources and you, it's harder to fit more people in. Replace x-ray in certain cases. If you can do MR fast enough, you could replace x-ray as the first line imaging, reduce radiation dose accordingly, change the way we acquire images and, and change clinical practice. And then I mentioned the open source aspect. We also committed together to provide open source and obviously importantly de-identified data. And so the next little update on that, just two weeks ago, at RSNA, we announced the release of the first bolus of open source data. Um, this is now 10,000 DICOM data sets and 1,600 raw data sets that we released fully anonymized um, for people to play around with and try out their algorithms for different types of accelerated imaging. We'll be launching some challenges as well down the line um, with partners. We hope uh, 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 people from here uh, can participate as well. And just a word on the collaboration model. Um, you know, not in any way, in a self-serving way, I like to think of this model as sort of the Avengers model of collaboration in the sense that you have colleagues who don't normally travel together with highly complementary and very distinct superpowers working together on a problem, uh, all with the specter of AI-generated apocalypse in the background. <laughs> so if you now think about feeding the data streams that I was just telling you about into a deep learning system or in any kind of AI system, you can start imagining that this really is now imitating the brain. Up till now, I've showed you only snapshots where we're trying to accelerate. But now imagine you did this on a dynamic data set. And to give you an example, let me pull this um, from um, uh, Daniel Ruckert's group at Imperial College London. This is an 11-fold accelerated cardiac image set reconstructed using a deep learning algorithm. And to my eye anyway, this is remarkable image quality for 11-fold acceleration. So you can now take a data stream and feed it in to these kinds of networks. You might need to change the topology of the network and so on. That's interesting research. <laughs> the other thing, okay, people recognize that one, yeah? Um, so the other thing that, and, and I, was, I promised I'd tell you why Facebook was interested in this problem in the first place. Um, yes, they wanted to do something that, that they could feel good about, that, that, that was good for the world, but they also wanted an interesting AI problem, and we, we went to them and we told them, so listen, what we're going to do is we're going to acquire a tenth of the data, and now we want your help reconstructing an image, but the image doesn't have to just be plausible, it also has to be true. And they said, true? That's interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's a hard problem, right? I mean, how do you actually n not just generate something with a GAN? This is the, these are now famous examples of successes on the top and not so much successes of generative adversarial networks. You can turn horses to zebras very effectively. You can also turn Putins to, you know, Putin centaurs. I don't know, whatever, whatever that is. Um, so we need to make sure, you know, even a few voxels off in the wrong places in these images can be problematic. So we need to make sure that these these results are right. I had an interesting discussion with, with John earlier today about the challenges of that. One of the ways to do this is actually to bring in physics. So rather than just learning everything blind, can you essentially incorporate as constraints into your neural network what we know about the acquisition? What was the gradient profile? What was the, the uh, sort of forward problem? Um, and that constrains our search base and makes it that we only look for physically plausible, not just visually plausible results. And so that also represents an interesting spectrum of current research on AI in general, and certainly for AI and reconstruction. Leaning on the data, with which you can get remarkable results. Leaning on the physics, which can get you, you know, more carefully curated results, but also maybe uh, um, 
you know, if, you, if, if, if you don't have a perfect model in your data, maybe you have a problem. So this balance between the two is going to be interesting, and my guess is some combination of the two will be valuable. But speaking of physics, why not bring in all of the other physics that we bring to bear in MR into these types of problems too? So I'm showing you an example now of tissue microstructure modeling. This is from uh, Dmitry Novikov and Els Fearmans in our biophysics group at NYU. There's been a, a real revolution in microstructure of late. Um, which has been interesting for me to follow from the outside, uh, in which the models that people use, exonal diameter, things like that, have been challenged increasingly. And people have been using techniques called from condensed matter physics to take what's happening at the cellular level and average it up to the voxel level and see what information remains. And so basically our voxels, of which we're very proud, they're a millimeter on a side, right? But the business end of what's going on in disease is often happening, at, often happening at the cellular level, which is microns on a side. And of course, you can attack this with molecular imaging, although molecular imaging often you know, uh, is, is down even lower in the, in the spatial scale. But another thing you can do is you can use the fact that water molecules diffuse about that dimension. They diffuse on the order of, you know, say, 10 microns during the characteristic time of an MR experiment. And so, you can use it as a probe of microstructure, use some techniques from condensed matter physics, and get out things like cell membrane permeability, demyelination versus axonal loss, not just sort of diffusion weighting, but actual quantitative parameters that survive this averaging. So then the question is, well, why not incorporate that together with learning? So you could imagine you have continuously acquired multidimensional data you have some learned system that's very good at reconstructing it, and you have the appropriate physical models on board together with, this is now that model of turning the streams into actionable information in the form, in this case, of biophysical fin fingerprints of disease. Okay, so for the last part of what I want to tell you about today, now let's ask the question, what does all of this mean for the actual devices we use? I've already shown you that tasks once relegated to complex hardware may increasingly be accomplished in software. So rather than trying to generate an image which can very easily be converted by a Fourier transform from raw data to image, now we can rely on the computation and do all sorts of other fancy things. So with the algorithms doing this heavy lifting for us and with the advent of cheap sensors, maker error modular electronics, what assumptions can we roll back about our scanners? So that's the Scanners of the future towards multi-sensor, multi-sensory imaging. So here's a quick summary of the evolution of the MR scanner from 1983 to 2017. And what you can see by quick inspection is, first of all, we lost the wood paneling, unfortunately, kind of like on our station wagons. Um, but this is a Siemens scanner, by the way, vintage uh, 1983. These are scanners uh, around 2017 with lots of bells and whistles and so on. It's the same basic design. It's a bore with a bed, right? with lots of important additions. But now we have AI active. So what does that mean? Well, let's imagine we have our acquisition machine and we have our reconstruction machine now, a neural net we've trained to reconstruct to the image. And then from the image, we might have another neural net we use for the interpretation. Why not cut out the middleman? Don't worry, I'm not really suggesting that we remove images from radiology, um, but at least raises the question, can we design approaches that go from the images and preserve not image quality so much, but information quality? And for that matter, if we now know something about information quality, can we start stripping down our scanners and remove some of that crazy over-engineering that goes into a remarkable device like the MR scanner? So what might that look like? Well, here's one example. How about the homogeneity of our fields? We spend a lot of time trying to get homogeneous fields inside the MR scanner. Be not fields, be one fields. This is an example from Martin Clues at our center who used MR fingerprinting to say, I don't care how homogeneous my B1 fields are anymore. Let me just throw a bunch of pulses from one coil and another coil and another coil and another coil at the system. Let me do an MR fingerprinting type approach so it's a complex pattern that you end up matching. And let me map out of this, what the B1 profile must have been to create that, along with the T1 map and the T2 map and the proton density. So rather than fighting for control, embrace complexity and just map it. 
there's some detail to this that you know make it complex, but 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 uh, um, just as a, as, a, as a paradigm. And here's a more concrete way of actually embracing flexibility. So this is one of my all-time favorite miserable failures of my career. This is the bore lining array, 126 elements, meticulously engineered. We, we thought, wouldn't it be cool if you can replace the body coil with 126 element arrays, so you can do parallel imaging in any dimension and so on, which was a great idea until all of those 126 coils immediately started talking to all of the others. And you know, countless person years later, this is now hanging up in our RF lab as a cautionary tale. Um, so it's a wonderful idea, but this type of approach, again, is sort of rigid engineering. So recently we've been going in the opposite direction. And this is work just published in uh, Nature Biomedical Engineering on a new flexible coil design, a high impedance coil, which I'll tell you about in a second. But the idea here is, you know, what, what uh, and this is Martin again along with Bei Zhang, they just took a glove, I think it was two bucks from Amazon, stitched these coils into each of the fingers, stitched another coil around the palm and another on the top of the hand. And for any of you who are RF coil designers, you're going to be saying, are you kidding me? That's the stupidest thing you could do because all these things are going to talk to each other. Basically, the trick here is we realized coils only talk to each other if they're carrying currents. We design all our coils as conductors. What if we design them as high impedance elements that are detecting voltage, not current? So these, for those of you who are interested, I can tell you later, these are essentially high impedance voltage detectors. It doesn't matter how we bend them. So we can now explore different gestures. These, by the way, you know, from the cover image here, this spells out MRI in American Sign Language. Just because. And so it means that we can now study complex gestures. And you see some of the representative images here of grasping. Um, we took some movies of someone simulating playing a piano in the scanner. You can start looking at kinematics in a way that was more difficult before. You didn't have the signal to noise to do it. And of course, we think this is way cool. But of course, we're not alone in this space by any means. GE has introduced these fascinating air coils that some of you have had a crack at that are very flexible and also purport to be immune to crosstalk between the coils. And then, of course, there's the in case space company um, that uh, um, is right up in, in Berkeley that's producing these printed coils. Still, you know, susceptible to coupling, but because you print them with the right configuration, they can be nice and flexible. Well, let's talk another, about another kind of flexibility. Can you introduce new information into the MR scan? Well, you guys have at least a couple MR PET scanners, right? So you know that you can very easily do a PET scan simultaneously with MR. So this is work by Florian Knoll again and Martin Clues, basically doing joint MR fingerprinting and PET. So MR fingerprinting to get multiple parametric maps and simultaneously getting PET and doing actually a joint reconstruction, taking advantage of mutual information, knowing that, okay, the PET contrast may be different from the MR, but they come from the same anatomy at baseline. So this is, in some ways, like another data stream. So if you're now doing PET and adding it to the MR, the stripped down MR we were talked about before, flexible, why not add ultrasound? Why not add a photonic helmet in there? Wearables of various sorts. When you start doing that, it's almost like you now have multiple senses. We are all so enamored of the rich information content of our MR scanners that we tend to try to get information just from that. Why aren't we pulling it from as many sensors as we can reliably fit inside the scanner? And once you've done that, you can imagine now you have a pretty robust data stream you can feed back if you want to do therapy. If you want to give real-time information about bioeffects of therapy, you have this whole sensor array with which you can do it. So let me give you a couple of very early examples because this is work that's just beginning. This is the use now of a pilotone for MR PET. It's really just an RF coil that we throw in that whose behavior changes with body loading. So if you have breathing, uh, for example, it will detect it wirelessly. Um, and we use this for um, uh, motion correction in MR PET. This is work I really love from Bruno Mador at Brigham Women's Hospital. He and his team are putting ultrasound transducers, little cheap ultrasound transducers on the body, not for imaging just to get echoes. So they have the ultrasound, they send out the, the um, signal, and they get echoes, and they deliberately sort of have it spread so it bounces off of lots of stuff on its way back. Really ugly, complicated looking signal. But you know what? It's kind of a fingerprint, isn't it? 
And so what they do is they correlate that fingerprint with the MR images they're getting. And then they do crazy things like take the patient out of the MR scanner and just from the ultrasound synthesize MR images just based on the ultrasound. Whether you'd want to rely on them for diagnosis is a whole other question, but at the very least there is this correlated information. And then of course, when it comes to ultrasound, it's not just sensors, it's effectors, right? You know, I, I realize I'm living in one of the birthplaces of uh, MR guided focused ultrasound. Um, and so now could you use this kind of stream to go back and influence how you're doing the ultrasound? So in some ways, we're all familiar with this modern paradigm. Everyone is obsessed with the self-driving car, right? Well, what's a self-driving car? It's a device that has a bunch of sensors that are constantly probing its external environment as well as a bunch of sensors that are constantly checking its internal environment to make sure all the subcomponents are working correctly, why can't we have the self-driving scanner, right? It's constantly aware of its internal environment, of the environment around the body. It's navigating through inhomogeneities, just like a car navigates among lanes and, and through various obstacles. In fact, why can't we have a scanner that just starts itself and gathers data continuously and finishes when it, it, it's good and ready? So th these kinds of things are becoming impossible. All right, let me, let me close here. What does all of this mean for you, the radiologists and also the researchers in the room? Well, I very much hope at the very least it'll result in faster imaging. Also in more flexible imaging, more quantitative imaging, and then hopefully more valuable imaging as well. New, rich, and diverse data streams, as I've shown you, I think are on their way towards us, and new multifaceted imaging devices as well, which also raises new opportunities for collaboration between physicians, biomedical scientists, engineers, and even nowadays data scientists. And of course, the important thing at the end of all of this is new signatures of health and disease. So a few take home messages and then you're free. Take home message number one. The days of the carefully framed snapshot I maintain are numbered and the era of continuous comprehensive medical imaging data is upon us. How many years it will take for such a transformation depends on a lot of factors, but it feels to me like this is the future. Take home message number two, we're not just copying our eyes anymore as imagers. We're emulating the way we experience the world. So if we embrace these kinds of new paradigms, I believe this is going to transform the way we build and use medical imaging devices. And we'll open up new horizons in the exploration of inner space. So a number of these themes are themes that we work on in our Center for Advanced Imaging uh, Innovation and Research at NYU and also were, were covered in, you know, from various angles at this recent uh, workshop, the I2I Innovation to Implementation and Imaging Workshop. Um, for those of you who are interested in seeing some presentations from various people around the world on these topics, um, we're, they're going to be going online in the next month or so. So you can check them out if you're interested. And with that, uh, I've tried to acknowledge the people who contributed slides and contributed work along the way with their photos. Um, any misstatements or oversimplifications are entirely my responsibility. Um, but I also want to thank the uh, group of work colleagues who every day show me new horizons. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank the NIH who funds our P41 grant. And then finally, my home team. That's Noah, Hannah, and Sarah there who uh, enrich my life and change my world every day. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Great to be here. So uh, it looks like we, I, I managed to finish in time for questions, so please uh, feel free to ask away. Well, I'll start. So, and, you know, going from compare sensing to machine learning, I, mean, I think it's a, it's a great step, I and mean, you, you really uh, bring that to the, to the uh, excellent, you know, lot of excellent points. But, you know, still, you know, how sparse is sparse? I think that, let's see, uh, how sparse can you go? What is the limit? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. It is a great question. In some ways, it's the question. Um, and I think image compression gives us a rough estimate, right? So if we know that with, with prior knowledge of the full content that we can compress by a factor of 10 for, static images or a factor of 20 for video, 
That at least bounds it for us, I think. Um, and we obviously need to back off somewhat from that. So I'm not claiming that magic can happen. But what I will say is we're leaving a lot of information on the table in the way uh, we, were, we, we generally do radiology. So, you know, there's lots of information in the scan we just finished, not to mention the scan that we're now getting, that probably we could bring in in order to accelerate more. So I think if we start looking at the imaging exam as a whole rather than just the particular image, we could probably get to a much, much higher degree of sparsity. Yeah, I, I think uh, in the future, uh, you know, when you talk about messing machine learning, maybe it's even better actually to give uncertainty, but, you know, so that there is certain, you know, when you go to an image, which is the, when you filling in the gap, I mean, obviously there is uncertainty. And, you know, compression thing is a known example where some, sometimes you oversimplify the image. Yes. Then when you go to machine learning, the problem is still there. Maybe you get better. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be nice to know that uncertainty. I, I could not agree with you more. Did, did everyone hear the question? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was about, uh, you know, wouldn't it be nice to actually quantify uncertainty in your reconstructions, particularly when you're using these types of things? There's actually some fascinating work that's starting to appear on use of variational autoencoders and other things to actually derive uncertainty maps. Um, now, whether we would actually be presenting those to clinicians and giving them still more pixels to look at, or whether we just use it in the development phase, you know, yet to be seen. But I do think it is possible to get those sorts of uncertainty estimates. The other thing that's related that I'll just mention is the question of metrics. How do we train our neural nets? You know, it turns out that we typically train them on mean square error from the reference image, and that is a god-awful metric that hides all sorts of flaws. So I, I, I think there's a lot of important work in that area to be done. Yeah, Brian. You made some intriguing comments about this, you know, big iron MRI scanner. Sort of stop short of saying, Scanners may not need the same level of technology. You know, they're strong and fast gradients in the main. What does that do? You darn, you noticed that I stopped short of saying that. <laughs> um, I believe we're going to need a modicum of signal to noise ratio and we're going to need spatial encoding of some sort. So I don't want to claim that you know, machine learning is all of a sudden going to overturn physics. Um, so I'm, that, that's why I'm cautious about claiming all of that. But I see absolutely no reason why we need homogeneity or linearity of any sort in the modern era as long as we preserve our signal. So in some ways, the criterion I would use is as long as you don't lose your signal to the noise, I don't care in the future what you do, how you encode it, as long as that encoding is reversible. Is that a fair answer? So yeah, I think, and I'd love to see people starting to mess around more with the hardware and see how much we can offload to the software. Yeah, okay. So uh, given the opportunities we have with MRI, speeding up MRI, potentially you know, following up on Brian's question, uh, similar things that we see today in CT, think the days of the plain film are over? So I, I, I don't know about entirely over, but I hope so in certain cases. I mean, there's been a lot of talk in ISMRM circles, you know, with the value initiative trying, of trying to move MR to the front line, you know, to, to have it be the, 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 the first imaging exam rather than the last one. I think if we make, you know, for example, in musculoskeletal arena, if we make a musculoskeletal MR exam fast enough, there should be no reason to do plain films of knees. You know, I, it just, and, and, and maybe there are musculoskeletal radiologists who will, who will debate me on that. Um, this is really happy to do that. <laughs> right, right. Um, so yeah, so I, I think part of this also will, will, if it's done right, change practice. You mentioned CT, of course, another thing about CT is, you know, you, you use these same algorithms on CT, and you guys are probably doing some of that, right? Um, you can make it a uh, much slower dose, right? I know you guys have done a lot of work on dose in PET, too. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, changing practice in terms of what dose of either radiation or contrast we give our patients, I think these types of techniques are going to be transformative. I think the question would be how will it change costs? Mm -hmm. Are we ready for ubiquitous imaging of high quality and low cost? What does that mean for the, for the people who are reading these studies? That's something that 
one thing that AI is no, no, no. And, and this is where I'm hoping that this whole question of information quality can come in. I mean, there's actually a fascinating study I just read on the plane on the way here about a neural network approach to mammography that has a dual training. The first part, you train a classifier to classify whether there's a problem on, on the mammogram. The second, you train a neural network to assess level of confidence. And if the level of confidence is above a certain threshold, you don't th show it to the radiologist at all. So you basically, you know, finally use it not in a, in a CAD way, which means more images for the radiologist to look at. You actually just take 50% of the scans that you're really confident are normal within the, you know, the, the normal error bounds of a radiologist's interpretation, and you leave only the, the interesting work. So that could be one way of getting at it. But the bigger question of the economics of it all, that's, that's a really interesting one.